All right, thanks for joining us. So today we're gonna to be interviewing Aaron Blaze and he is an internationally renowned artist and animator. He spent over 30 years in the industry working for Disney on Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, Mulan, and many other films that have stood as beloved treasures of our time. Aaron currently teaches animation and art in classes and workshops around the world, sharing his passion and love of nature and illustration. He has a popular YouTube channel called The Art of Aaron Blaze, where he gives tutorials and insights into his techniques and inspirations in art. You can check out his website at creatureartteacher.com. Thanks for joining us again, and here's the interview. All right, so I'm here with Aaron Blaze from his studio in the sunny and warm Florida. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it is warm too. Yeah, you are welcome. I hope you're warm wherever you are. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wisconsin, there's like four inches of snow, oh, yeah. it's 20 degrees, so. Uh, no, no, we're about 70 degrees today, so uh, it's a little different. Nice. Um, so, as we were, were talking here, um, you said you've been in the industry for, you know, about 32 years now. Uh, so, when and how did you develop an interest in art and animation? Or is there a specific passion of yours, or a yeah. person that may have inspired you and led you, you know, to where you are today? In this, in no, this long career? Yeah, well, it, it's funny how I ended up in animation. Uh, I, I just happened to fall into it. I, you know, a lot of the guys that I've worked with over the years, they, all they ever wanted to be was animators. And they, you know, they pushed their whole lives to, to achieve that goal. And, and um, I was a little bit different. I grew up down in South Florida, uh, kind of in the swamps, in this little single wide trailer. And uh, all I ever wanted to do was draw animals. And I was always running around out in the woods, uh, chasing, tracking, drawing. Uh, I was a creepy little kid. You know, I'd bring home roadkill. <laughs> I'd bring oh, home nice. roadkill to study anatomy if it wasn't too smushed. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and I would draw it, you know, to understand animal anatomy. And I wanted to learn everything I could. I would go back and forth between wanting to be an animal artist or a vet. Uh, I went through a little stint where I wanted to be uh, go into forestry. But it always brought me back to my art. And so I really grew up wanting to do natural history type art, whether it's animal drawing and painting or whatever. And a big part of my life when I was living in that little trailer were National Geographic magazines, and I had piles of them. And uh, those were my escape to the rest of the world. And I loved the illustrations in those magazines. And as I got older, I thought, man, wouldn't it be great to be on staff at National Geographic and do these illustrations I, I've always loved. And so that kind of became my goal by the time I got to art school when I was 18, I decided I wanted to work for National Geographic. And so I went to the Ringling College of Art and Design and it was about my first year, uh, towards the end of my first year, that I found out that National Geographic really didn't have staff illustrators doing the illustrations that I loved so much, those were all freelanced. And I had spent my whole college career freelancing my way through school in order to pay rent and buy my groceries and all that. And I really didn't want to freelance anymore. I wanted to kind of find a staff position somewhere. So I had to kind of re-pivot and, and uh, kind of find a different vision. And so um, it just so happened that there were two companies coming to our school to interview um, and at the end of that year, one was um, uh, Hallmark Cards, and the other one was Disney. And so I thought, no, oh, I'll put together a portfolio for both and just see what happens. And lucky for me, Disney was the first to come in. And so I put together a portfolio of figure drawings, human figure drawings, and animal drawings. And, um, and they were doing this test, Disney was. It was the first time they'd ever gone outside of animation schools. And Ringling at the time, even though it's known as kind of an animation school now, they didn't have animation. I was an illustration teacher. And so Disney had kind of tapped out all the animation schools around the continent, and they wanted to see if they could expand their, their search into schools that had a good foundation in drawing and painting and bring in those students and see if they could teach them animation right at the studio. And so I was part of that pilot program. It was the very first time they tried. And so they came to Ringling and I put out my portfolio and lo and behold, myself and one other guy from the, from the school got in. And it turned out that Disney picked about eight people from across the country, uh, college students to come out to 
their studio in Burbank, California, and learn animation. And this was about the time they were finishing up Oliver and Company. This is in 1987. And, uh, and getting started with uh, um, the Great Mount, or no, um, Little Mermaid. It was 87 or 88, actually, it was 88. And, uh, and so I got my little beat up Honda Civic, 1982 Honda Civic, drove across the country. And I thought maybe, you know, I'd, I'd go through this internship and become a background painter or, or something, but I really never mm -hmm. thought about animation. And it wasn't until I got there and I met my mentor, you know, I, all of us got matched up with a different professional, a different uh, animator. And, and I was lucky enough that I got matched up with a, with a guy named Glenn Keane. Now, Glenn is one of the top contemporary animators in the world. He created The Little Mermaid. He created Tarzan. He created The Beast. He, you know, he's just responsible so for so many wonderful characters at Disney. And, um, and it turns out he kind of had a similar background where he wanted to be a painter and, and went to school and found animation and, and, and became an animator. And so when I went into his office, really still not knowing what this was all about, he sat me down and he was showing me some of the work he was getting ready to do on, on the little mermaid and showing me some of the work he was just finishing up on, on Oliver and company. And, and he was just talking about all the, the possibilities that animation can bring to an artist, you know, for expression, the passion that you can put into it. It's not just drawing, but it's movement, it's physics, it's emotion, it's acting, it's music, it's so many different things. And I remember sitting there for maybe 10 minutes and realizing within that 10 minutes, you know, my whole life had changed and this is now what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that was that. That's how I became an animator. Nice. So uh, at that moment, it's basically just like your inspiration, like this was it too exciting to pass up. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So, and what was interesting was, you know, the internship was only six weeks. It was only a month and a half. Wow. And in that month and a half, they were able, able to teach myself and a few of the other people enough animation that they hired us. And so at the end of my internship, they offered me a job at the studio in Florida that was just opening up. Uh, it opened in uh, 1989. It was actually a year after uh, my internship. And there was, that was the animation studio that was at the MGM Studios at Disney World in Florida. And, uh, and so I went back to school and finished up my last year at school knowing that I had a job waiting for me uh, in the animation department at Disney. And so I finished up and, and started there. And I was there for in that studio for 15 years. And then they decided to sit down and and I transferred to California. I was with Disney in California for another six and a half years after that. Okay, um, I have a question about animation, but first I wanna, uh, for, for our listeners that uh, maybe don't have a background in art uh, and aren't familiar with this, uh, with this field, um, can you give us an insight into you know, what the training looked like? Uh, you know, your, your artwork, you know, it's, it's you know, this top quality art. What does it take to um, what kind of training did you have to get to that point? Well, as a hand-drawn animator, if we're talking about the stuff like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, Pocahontas, Mulan, you know, all those films, that was all still done by hand. And so a lot of people don't realize that. You know, same, we made those movies the same way that they made Bambi and Snow White and Pinocchio. And, and it's, you sit down and you draw, and you draw 24 frames for every second of film that goes through that camera. And so it's a labor intensive um, endeavor, uh, but really our language is drawing. And so in order to be the best animator you can be, you need to be the best draftsman you can be. So a lot of our training is just in the fundamentals of drawing, figure drawing, animal drawing, understanding form. Um, the more fluent we are in our visual language, which is drawing, the more fluent we're able to convey our ideas. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we always say is that a good animator is an actor just with a pencil. And that's really what we do. We sit down and when we animate, we're not just, you know, the art of animation is ju not just moving something. It's the art of bringing something to life. And it's really understanding emotion. Uh, on top of all that, you need to understand physics. You need to understand form. You need to understand space. You need to understand timing because you're, you know, you have to work within that fourth dimension, which is time. And so 
a lot of practice that goes into that, but really the most fundamental really is just drawing, drawing to the best that you possibly can. And it really requires a lot of practice. And so we would literally draw every day. And I still at 51 years old, draw every single day to keep my skills up to where they need to be. So in, in these films, uh, you know, Beauty and the Beast, uh, you, you, you were illustrating the beast, uh, Raja and Aladdin, you know, amongst many of these other characters. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up in the nineties. Uh, I was about six or seven years old when these films came out. I was at a perfect age. Uh, so Aladdin, I basically had down verbatim. Yeah. Uh, you were and, my target audience. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and how much freedom were you given in animating these characters, you know, creating, creating the characters themselves, the story. Uh, Did you have a lot of leeway there or did they have a a very specific uh, vision? Well, I I always explain it that, you know, we have the exact same freedoms that live actors have to play their roles. So, you know, we have a script just like a live actor has a script and we have a character, just a live actor has a character except rather than, playing a human character, I might be playing a lion or I might be playing a tiger or I might be playing something who knows what. And, um, and so within that script and those storyboards, because we go from script, script to storyboard and the storyboard is basically a comic book broken up into individual images that we put up on the screen and we can watch a movie, you know, one frame or one image at a time to get, to get a sense of pacing. And then after that, we go ahead and start to animate. And so within a shot, um, and then a group of shot, shots make up a scene, within that framework, I have a lot of leeway in, uh, to convey the acting and the emotion that's in the script and the storyboards that needs to get across. So um, it's really a collaboration between the writers, the storyboard artists, and the animators that really bring that character to life. Um, every step that we, you know, we always say that every step should improve upon the la- the step before it. And so the first step really is writing. And that's all just written words on a page. And so then it has to become pictures. And so the storyboard artists take it from there and hopefully they improve upon it there. They are able to bring character through their staging, through their uh, expression, the way they draw the characters in the storyboards. And then when it comes time to actually move those characters and bring them to life, that's not, that's my job. And so hopefully I'm taking it a step further and adding even more to for, and within that, there is a lot of, there's a lot of freedom. Yeah. So, uh, at 24 frames per second of animation, you obviously have to spend a lot of time. I mean, you can spend a lot of time uh, delving into these characters, uh, you know, developing the music, really planning it out. But now the industry, uh, a lot of it's switched to, you know, digitized, uh, you know, digital art, Mm -hmm. animation, things like that. So do you think that's affected uh, the whole animation scene in terms of, you know, what you can express or how how do you view um, this digital, uh, new digital platform that people are using for animation and art? Well, it's funny. It's not new. That's the thing about it. It, it feels new and it, it gets improved upon with every film, but it really started in 1995 with Toy Story. And that was the first fully digital film. And it's really grown from there. And I've always explained digital animation. It's the same as what we do. It's just a fancier pencil. And um, they still have to follow the same fundamentals for physics, for acting, for timing, for all the same, you know, the same stuff. It's just done with a different tool. And so it's interesting because animating uh, 3D, computer animation, is not any faster than 2D animation. They still have to think about frame by frame. Um, and it's not any less expensive. That was the other thing, too. A lot of people thought it would save money, but it really, it really is the same budget. So it's interesting how... Um, You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, the advantages or disadvantages. I think it's cool. I've always loved, you know, cutting edge technology. Um, I was sad to see that it kind of pushed 2D animation, hand-drawn animation aside in the marketplace. But I think with new platforms coming out for distribution of content, things like 
the streaming platforms like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and, and uh, Disney Plus, you know, these are going to provide a huge area for us to start seeing, I think, more content. And within that content, I think we're going to see a lot more 2D animation. I think a great example uh, that just came out on, uh, on November 15th on uh, Netflix was Klaus, which is the new hand-drawn 2D animated uh, Christmas uh, story. Okay, I'll have to watch and, that. Uh, and it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And it's had rave reviews, and I think that's really going to open the door uh, to a flood, I think, of, of 2D animation. And not just 2D animation, way that Disney kind of set the standard in the 90s, but a whole new look, a whole new way of storytelling visually uh, in that medium. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. And also, uh, to add to this, I, I, I think it, with, with digital art, um, I, I know in my case, it's actually made art accessible because, um, you know, I saw it in traditional art form, oil painting, mm -hmm. um, you know, drafting, things like that. Uh, it just takes a while because you know I, I have my day job, everything like that. Uh, so I, I did it more as like just a just a form of expression. But um, you really have to squeeze in the time. Whereas with with uh, you know I, I I bought an iPad Pro and you know I have Procreate on it. And, yeah. You know in the mornings then you know I just wake up early. I draw thirty minutes to an hour, and you know I, I'm able to actually squeeze in art now. Uh, so great. for me, it's really opened this door. And I know for a lot of people too, uh, it just makes it extremely accessible. Uh, you know, especially if you look at, you know, kids nowadays, right. um, they're, they're using these uh, technologies and they're just so yeah. much more visually advanced than I yeah. think my generation was. Uh, so how, how do you see all this? I mean, cause, cause you, you have tutorials, uh, and that's another thing too. It's it's so easily accessible um, to to learn now, thanks to people like you and in, in your your uh, your website and your YouTube videos. So I don't right. know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, there is a. I had a wonderful career, and I'll go I'll go way back because th there is actually a build up to how I ended up doing what I'm doing now. Um, I had a wonderful career at Disney, and um, by the time I left Florida and went out to California. Um, I brought my family, my wife, Karen, my two kids, Austin and Dustin, and we went out and uh, I was making a new movie and everything was great. And, um, uh, and that was about a year, about a year into living in California, making this new movie. My wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I tried, uh, you know, as we tried to get her cured, I spent less and less time at the studio, more time at home. And to the point where we were, uh, my partners, uh, my directing partner and my producer spent all of our working time at my home so that I could take care of my wife who wasn't getting better. And, um, and eventually, you know, in uh, 2007, uh, she passed away, you know, in my arms and we had the whole family there. And, and uh, but, you know, we had been together for 20 years and my heart was just completely broken. Oh, wow. And it was the first time that I really lost my my drive or any kind of vision for any kind of art and working. And so I really struggled, you know, once we got through her memorial and um, getting back to work and kids were having a hard time. And it really, I really kind of lost that zest or, you know, for, for working. And I was directing this new movie and I tried to, uh, tr I tried to work on it for almost two years before finally, they came to me and said, Aaron, this isn't working out. And I said, I know. And, uh, and so they wanted me to go off into another department. And, uh, and that, in that moment I said, you know, I think I, I think I need to quit and start over and, and, and kind of find myself again. I said, you know, I, I've always really defined myself by two different things. It was my job. That was such a big part of me and because of my art, you know, animation and all that and my family. And both had really crumbled. And so I was really lost and needed to find out, you know, what am I going to do next? And so I left Disney. This is in 2010. And uh, came back to Florida, my home with the kids. And um, by this point, the kids are growing up and leaving home. And, you know, we got closer and that was feeling a lot better. And then I found a new studio here in Florida that was looking for a director. And so I jumped in and 
and uh, another my producer in in California, he came on with me. He left Disney, and we became uh, directing partners at this new studio. But after three years, <laughs> that studio went bankrupt, and so I was back to no job again. And this time, I really wanted to I decided I didn't want to go back to the studios and have my life really kind of. Uh, directed by executives and I decided that I wanted to kind of create my own path and if I succeeded it was going to be because of me and if I failed it would be because of me and I remember sitting there thinking about Glenn Keane that that mentor that that taught me so much when I was younger and thinking about how in this modern day and age I can share all of that information through YouTube or websites or whatever and I'd have this ability to kind of go global with it. And that really became the inspiration. I remember the morning that it popped into my head. And so it was that morning that I called my friend, uh, Nick Birch, who later became my business partner. I said, Hey, I want to do this. And I, I'm, you know, we're going to need a website and, 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 you know, all kinds of different things that I wasn't tech from a technical standpoint, I wasn't savvy with. And so he came on and he helped me and we created this business to spread basically the last 30 years of knowledge that I've been able to accumulate and share it, you know, with the world. And going back to your other point about, you know, the digital world, it was during this time that I was in California that I started learning digital art and it really opened up a whole new world for me because of how expressive it can be. And, and, and my ability to mix not just my paintings, but, but mix them with my photography as well and create imagery that and, and worlds that no one really had ever seen before. And so that became another outlet. And I really love, like you were saying earlier, this ability to sit down digitally and you can just, you know, open up a program and start drawing and painting and you can get it out of your system. It's not, you don't have to go through the process of setting out your palette and squeezing out the oil and getting the brushes, and getting the canvas and doing all that stuff, which, I still do when the time is right, but when I want to sit down and just get some images out of my system, then, you know, sitting down and drawing digitally is wonderful. And it still follows all the same rules and, and everything else that I do in traditional art. It's just a different way of, of expressing myself. So all of that, you know, combined with, you know, this me finding this new business through this kind of long path of turmoil and heartache. Um, I've really come to a place that I really love what I'm doing creatively and being able to share it and do it digitally. You know, what we're doing right now, you know, talking on your podcast is something that we couldn't do, you know, not too long ago. And so it's these types of things that where we can share ideas and visions and things like that on a global scale that really inspire me now. Yeah, nice. Um, and, you know, I've watched a lot of your videos and, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of inspiration from them, from, from my own work. And, you know, it kind of seems like we have the same background because I, I, I was really into, you know, the wilderness and, and things like that, you know, in Wisconsin, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of, like a lot of tracking and stuff. So, um, you know, the wildlife perspective, you know, coming at it from that perspective just really resonated with me. Um, and Great. What, some of the YouTube videos you had on there, uh, you talked a lot about sketchbooks, and I thought this was just a really interesting topic that I just want to touch on a little bit because sure. uh, it, there, there's in in the field of you know the visual language, uh, you know anyone that's like a musician or something, you know they would pick up a violin or play it, you know kind of thing. Um, for artists, you know a sketchbook is kind of like in a way, you know we have our paper instrument, you know it's how we kind of practice, right? Right. And uh, so you get into a lot of, in your in your YouTube videos and, and you I don't I'll, I'll, I'll let you explain it. But I just thought yeah. you, you're 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 kind of layout of a spe sketchbooks and how important they are. Um, I thought it was just really, really interesting topic. Yeah. Um, you know, a sketchbook for me is more than just a place where I practice a sketchbook. It's its, its own piece of art. It's its own piece of expression. And it's its own piece of uh, for me. It's a it's a it's a book of memories. And um, what I love about sketchbooks is, yes, it's a place where I go to practice, but it's also, I'm recording, I'm recording, uh, it's almost like a, a video camera or a tape deck, <laughs> you know, 
where um, I'm recording what's happening around me, but I'm just doing it through my visual vision and coming, making it come out of my hands into a book. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I can, I can go into my sketchbook and I've got sketchbooks that go back 15, 20, 30 years. And, you know, I can go through them and look at every sketch and I remember the temperature. I remember the smells. I remember everything about what was going on while I was making that sketch. Wow, yeah. The reason for that is, you know, or at least for me, and I know it's this way for a lot of artists, when you're sitting there and you're sketching, you're hyper aware. You're, you're feeling the wind, you're looking, at, you're not just looking, you're seeing, you're soaking in that scene and, and bringing it into your brain and translating it and making it come out of your fingers. And the act of doing that, it really cements itself into your psyche. So, so much so that you can go back, like I said, and, and open those books and remember, and I've got thousands of sketches and, and tons of books. <laughs> And I remember every moment from making those sketches. And it's really wonderful because some of them are from, you know, when my, my wife and I took a trip and I can go back and it's like I'm going back in time. And I can remember, you know, the times we had by going through those sketches. There's another one. Some people have thought this was kind of weird and morbid. But, you know, when my mother was dying, I sat with her. I was the only one there. And... And she, it took about four days as she slowly drifted away. And there was a lot of open time where it was just a ticking clock and me sitting there in her room for hours and hours. And I started to think about the poetry of the moment, you know, thinking that, you know, I know she, I know she was going out. This is the cycle of life. And I thought of how beautiful it was that she had given me this gift. My mother was artistic as well. And, and so she brought me into this world and gave me this gift of drawing and, and that sort of thing. And so as she was leaving the world, I decided to draw and draw her. And, it, and for me, it was kind of a thank you to her. And so I, that's in my sketchbook. And so I can go through the sketchbook and find this really super meaningful, deep, um, Thing that's really just a few lines on on the paper but it goes to so much more than that because what's interesting is just a few uh just a few months after that my granddaughter was born and I sat and sketched her when she was only seven hours old with my daughter and they're in the same sketchbook as my mother passing away so they can get really really deep and really meaningful they're for me like I said they're more than just a place where you go and doodle and practice, they become something more than that if you let them. And, uh, and so they're, they're very powerful. Yeah. Very, very beautiful. Um, yeah, definitely just, you know, working through, you know, emotions, anything like that, you know, just, just spending time with it, uh, you know, in that really focused uh, state of mind. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, I just want to end up uh, just uh, asking, you know, uh, where you where you're at now, because um, you have so many different projects going on. Just so our listeners can can know where to find you and 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 what you're doing right now. You're right. I do have a lot of different projects, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, the main thing that I've, I've really focused on is you know the content for our website, creatureartteacher.com. Um, that's our educational site, and my main focus is really creating more and more content and really filling that out as years go by. I want to really dig deep and, you know, I want to make sure, but by the time I'm not on this earth anymore, I've been able to get out everything I know into this website so that people can, can continue to pull from it. But along with that, um, when we have the time, I'm, uh, we're making a, a, a new animated short right now that's been taking a while to get off the ground, but slowly taking shape. It's called Snow Bear, and it's about a, a, a lonely uh, a bear in the Arctic and a polar bear that's, uh, he's so lonely that eventually he just makes a snow bear and they become friends. And uh, it's a sweet little, about eight minute cartoon that we're, we're, we're making and, and we're really excited about that. Um, but we're also delving into doing a lot of live uh, teaching uh, uh, on the web and also doing live workshops. 
We just did a live workshop this past July where we rented out an entire castle uh, just south of Manchester, England, and brought in a whole bunch of people for five days. And we painted along the countryside and and stayed at the castle. We want to do more things like that. Yeah. Uh, my business partner, Nick, and I, we just got back. You know, I still love animals. I still draw animals and I teach a lot of animal drawing and, and anatomy. We just got back from Safari in Kenya uh, where we, you know, we spent 10 days chasing lions and elephants and all kinds of fun stuff. And, and, uh, and that's, you know, making its way into our work as well. So, um, you know, it's a lot of animal drawing, a lot of animation teaching and, and continued, you know, courses for our website. And, uh, and that's pretty much what you'll see us doing for the next couple of years. Well, awesome. Well, Aaron Blaze, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, definitely, uh, listeners, just check out his work. It's absolutely fantastic. So, um, well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, anytime you want to get back together, let's do it. This is great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you.